Actually, uh, we're just looking, we're in, uh, this is session number 47 since we started these about a year and a half ago. So today we've got some good speakers lined up for you, folks with a lot of experience in the cattle industry. Uh, and so <clears throat> we're excited about our session today. My name is David Lawman. I'm an extension beef cattle specialist. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Beck and Dr. Biggs, uh, kind of my partners in crime on this program here to introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Rosalind Biggs. Uh, I'm also an extension beef cattle specialist uh, with OSU Extension, of course, as well as the College of Veterinary Medicine. I'm Paul Beck. I'm a, a beef nutrition specialist at, at OSU along with, with Dave and, and Rosalind. Uh, welcome to the Ranchers Thursday, and I want to uh, give a short advertisement for our upcoming sessions. We're going to extend this uh, about three more weeks into November, looking at um, carrying wean calves on into the winter with our higher feed costs. So, you know, when you uh, get a chance and enroll in those series, we've got a, a nice series of uh, uh, webinars upcoming for for that topic yeah good idea thank you dr beck <clears throat> we've got two experienced ranchers lined up uh, to discuss their operations with us here today relative to feeding cows but on november 4th two of the first speakers in that series are experienced ranchers from kind of the other corner of the state uh, and their their topic will be uh, dry wintering calves uh, so minimal feed costs, but then grazing those calves through the summer. Okay, well, our first speaker today uh, is uh, Brian Frecking, area livestock specialist from uh, southeast Oklahoma. And uh, Brian's topic today is minimizing hay waste. All right, Dave, thank you for this opportunity. I'll see if I can uh, start sharing my screen if it's not already there. Looks good, Brian. Okay, so so I'm going to talk about minimizing hay waste and uh, uh, going to kind of focus in on three three uh, sub points of making it, storing it, and feeding it. And so um, this picture kind of reminds me of, of back home in Iowa where I grew up and thinking back to my early days of, of putting up hay and we, we put up a little bit of alfalfa around the neighborhood and also uh, uh, oat straw. And so that, that was one of my favorite jobs was to start off as a young kid was to, to rake the hay. So that kind of leads me right into the next, uh, next slide, which is, um, let's see if I can get this to work. So thinking about losses in the field due to due to to making it, uh, the mowing of course is is going to be zero percent losses of any kind of uh, material. Uh, the, there is going to be some respiration depending on what part of the country you're from, and and that can be anywhere from two to sixteen percent. And so the one area we can kind of manage a little bit is the raking aspect, and so we've seen anywhere from five to 20% in the, in the literature, uh, and it may depend on the type of rake you have. Uh, in this picture, I've got a wheel rake in the, in the biggest picture, and uh, we've got a rotary type of rake and a parallel bar rake. And, and the, the article down below, Dr. Uh, Shinners, uh, I was doing research on this topic, and I, I found that one to be a very, very good topic or uh, a read if you wanna find out more information on the differences in the raking. And, and the, the answer is usually the, the good extension answer, it depends. And so if, it's, uh, if you're trying to target something to, to dry it down quicker, that uh, rotary rake might be better. If you're trying to save on cost, you know, the wheel rake might be the, the tool to use, but uh, they all have a, have a piece in the pie, if you will. And so, um, you know, field losses do occur uh, and, and it's just, um, one of those things that we do have some control over. Now, the last thing we don't have much control over is weather. And we've got a, a, a variation there of zero to 35%. And I always think about my uncle when growing up, he would talk about when, when hay got rained on, he would, he would be the eternal optimist and say, well, that's just, that's just uh, washing the dust off of it. And so 
it does have some losses and let's let's look at the next slide and talk about those a little bit we want to make hay when the the sun is shining of course uh, we usually get our best quality when we when it doesn't get rained on but what happens if we get a typical you know one inch rain or or even more and so they did some simulations uh, in this particular study uh, looking at uh, no rain versus 1.6 inches of rain versus 2.4 inches of rain. So think of it as a rain simulation. On those different uh, forage crops, we have alfalfa and red clover in this particular case. And we do see some dry matter losses of 8 to 17 uh, percent. Crude protein decreases on, on both of those types. Uh, forages, uh, NDF increases, and, and if you think about NDF, when you, when you get a forage sample taken, uh, typically we want that number to be lower. So as it increases, it's usually meaning that uh, we don't have as good a quality and, and we're getting some loss there. So TDN decreases uh, nearly 7%, and so if we look at the alfalfa versus the red clover, we, we see versus no rain uh, to 2.4 inches of rain, we get quite a quite a decrease in that in that digestibility. And so TDN is important. Not only is crude protein important, but TDN is, is as well. So when we think about the other aspect of storage, so we've, we've kind of taken care of the, the uh, making it part of the presentation. Storing it, our, our gold standard is to try and put hay in the barn. And uh, we, we typically only see anywhere from two to 5% losses uh, in the barn. And in, in Oklahoma, I would say uh, our biggest losses even in this barn are from the ground up. And so this particular picture shows no cement floor. Uh, it's just just uh, just a, a dirt floor, and that's very typical of a lot of places that store hay in, in barns. Uh, and we do see some losses from from the bales wicking that moisture up from the soil itself. And so this leads me into one of our tools that can be found on beef.okstate.edu, um, and and it's in that calculator section in the bottom right hand corner. We've, I've got a box of, of orange. Uh, tabs that you can click on. And if we click on those calculators, one of the tools is a Texas AgriLife and OSU extension uh, tool uh, to kind of calculate whether it's feasible to, to build a hay storage shed. And so this tool kind of works off of the, the bale prices, the number that you would feed, but it also goes off of um, substituting uh, different um, feedstuffs, if you will. And so corn is a big big aspect of that calculation and then uh, cottonseed meal is a big calculation. So if we, we looked at the original tool when you download it, it's going to have corn in there at about $3.50 a bushel. And we know that corn has gone up substantially. And so when I typed in 570 a few few weeks ago, um, you know, we almost knock off six to seven months just based off of corn prices. And so, you know, as feed prices go up, it makes sense that we want to store a, a, a valuable piece of our uh, uh, of our feed supplies to our animals. So maybe take a look at that uh, uh, tool to see if that's something you want to look into. And if we think about hay storage, you know, the higher quality hay, it's it equals the increased reason for storage. And and so in this picture, alfalfa is the queen of, of all forages, and and so it makes the most sense that that would be one of the crops that we want to, would want to store inside a, a, a hay shed. And so, you know, just, just remember, you know, so hay testing, which was brought up in a lot of these uh, sessions, you know, is an important aspect in which, which type of hay we might want to store in the barn. At least in the Eastern Oklahoma side, I have gotten questions over the years, you know, what about baleage? We tend to have the hardest time of putting up hay in the spring of the year when we get the most rain. And so, you know, is baleage an option? And the thing to remember about baleage, there's a lot of, a lot of things to have pros and cons on, but uh, that moisture content in those is gonna be put up around 45 to 60% moisture. So we've got a lot of weight, a lot of moisture weight in those bales. It's gonna be required that, that you get a good seal. So if uh, there gets a puncture in those plastic bales, we're, we're gonna lose some, some of the quality as well. So. The, the pros, obviously, for baleage is we think we can in, increase our chances of harvesting on a timely manner. We can at, maximize the quality and hopefully uh, return that to the animals. 
optimize maybe some of the yields. Uh, we don't need a barn. You know, those, those marshmallow, marshmallow bales is what I call them can be stored outside. And in this case, this is more like a sleeve and, and there's several bales stacked in there. And so we would hope that we, we would know the, the quality of that forage and we can increase animal performance and consistency. The cons again, we're gonna need some more, more uh, larger equipment, more equipment to handle those. Uh, what do we do with the plastic in this case? And, uh, and then if we were to sell them those kinds of, thing, kind of things, not everybody's set up to handle the, you know, baleage uh, weight bale. And so uh, the biggest thing I see in Oklahoma is the spoilage once you start opening up those bales. And so uh, in, in South Dakota, where I went to school, we could open those up and it would be on a, uh, when the temperature is still below zero and uh, basically it freezes back up and we don't see a lot of spoilage. But in Oklahoma, we, we tend to have very few of those days and I'm hoping we don't have one like we had last February here in Oklahoma. Here's one of the kind of the fact sheets that's available in a lot of county offices that talks about good ground storage recommendations. And, and in the top right hand corner, there's some railroad ties with some rock layered. And so again, we're, we're trying to keep that um, the bottom uh, wicking mechanism from those bales from a from happening there. And then notice also there's a gap between those bales. And so in the bottom lower portion where those bales got stacked right next to each other, if rain does fall on top of those bales, they kind of uh, don't have a chance to dry out. Now, obviously terrain is gonna be a big factor. You know, does that water uh, kind of dissipate off the land, especially here lately, we've got about an inch, inch and a half to, uh, in the last day or so. And, and so that tends to stand and puddle up. Um, I had a, had a friend of mine that uh, put some bales next to some trees and, and he, he joked about how the ryegrass and that, that hay bale started to grow again. So he was making hay as he was storing is what he told me. But uh, actually that's not a good deal. We don't want it in a shaded area. We want those things to dry out when we do get rainfall in, in a hay storage situation. So what is the percent dry matter loss of round hay bales? You know, if we just put them out there on the ground, we can look anywhere from five to 20% in, in the first nine months. If we start storing that hay even longer, we can, we can lose almost half of that hay. And I've seen some hay bales go down the road on some, somebody's uh, uh, trailers that it, it looks like you know, half of that bale had, had wasted away. You know, if we can elevate those things, put them on a pallet, uh, we're gonna reduce that percentage. And, and then we've looked at different uh, storage methods and, and uh, Dana Zook has a project going on that we're still looking to kind of reiterate or, or find out some different storage methods. And so you can see on this graph some typical losses on, on storing hay. One of, the, one of the neat aspects of some of the research that I've seen is that uh, we can see kind of some spoilage on that hay and it's usually on, you know, on that outer layers that we see that loss. And so we can actually measure that, that amount and kind of predict how much spoilage or, or loss that the cattle are gonna refuse. And so if we see a six inch outside layer there uh, on a five foot diameter bale, we're losing about 36% of the dry matter. And so when we think about that in terms of actual cost, if we take that same 35% there and, and my calculations here lately have been about $100 a ton for hay prices, if not a little bit higher, uh, you know, the easy, easy math on $100 is 35% loss on that outside six inches is gonna cost us 30, $35 a ton. And so that can add up quickly. And, and this doesn't include, uh, you know, any, any losses associated with uh, shrinkage or actual quality. So one of the neat studies that's been done, but Dr. Lawman is, is looking at hay waste and the different hay rings. And so obviously the, the, the Baxter feeder here has been, been one of the, the key ones that um, was in that study. And so let's look at that. I put together a, a kind of a poster. And if we look at that basket type, um, feeder, it's, you know, it is going to be more expensive, but the waste on that is around 5.3%. Um, if we have a steel uh, skirted hay, hay uh, ring in, in B here at uh, half, maybe half the price, we had about a drop in about 13%. And so the shop type um, hay rings that uh, we see in the other two sessions there, uh, 20, around 20 to 21% uh, in waste uh, in, a, in about a 72 hour period. 
And so if we, if we want to make some comparisons, you know, 40 cows eating around 32 pounds a day for over 120 day period, we're going to, we're going to have around, um, you know, six tons of actual forage that uh, could have been saved by going with that basket type over the, uh, the sheeted bottom uh, metal one there in, in, in B there. So that 13% minus the 5% gives me that eight. Um, we could also look at any, any one of the D and, and, and C categories there, 21 minus the 13, and we still got that 8%. So depending on what you want to, uh, you know, calculate there, we're, we're still getting around six tons of savings uh, when you look at the different types there. The Noble Foundation actually uh, utilized uh, some of Dr. Lohman's um, data there and created an app. And so if you want to uh, compare you know, new numbers of, of what the hay cost today, you can sure punch those in there and, and that app is, is listed in this, in this particular uh, uh, slide there. I have looked at some other ones. I don't know, um, you know, all of these. I've, I've looked on some YouTube videos and, in, in the, you know, the aspect of getting those hay, hay bales off the ground is an important aspect. But it seems like maybe the shape of some of these hay, hay bale feeders, the, the one on the bottom right hand corner, they call that a, uh, oh, a, uh, a tombstone style. And what they mean by that is there's, there, there's, there's a level that you can, you can go right up to that uh, bars on the top side there, but the cattle are, are stopped by the, uh, the metal sheeting on the bottom. And so they don't push against that bale and maybe uh, cause them when they grab that hay, it drops right back down into that hay feeder. And that's kind of what I found with these, uh, these galvanized ones in the top right hand corner is that that shape of that feeder is, is, is very similar to that cone shape. And so I don't have equipment in my own operation to, to move one of those really big cone feeders around and I can still uh, manage to move one of those uh, uh, galvanized ones around by hand uh, by rolling. It's not the easiest thing in the world to do, but at least I can do it by hand with that one. And I, and I found very similar type losses compared to that cone feeder. One of the last uh, interesting uh, deals in my job was to go around um, to Arkansas and, and see some of the, uh, the, the options that they were promoting. And, and one of them was um, reducing waste by rolling the hay out. And, and we can have lots of variation in hay waste by just rolling it out. If we put a week's worth of hay out by just rolling it out, uh, we're gonna have a lot of waste. But if we just put the amount that, that the cows are gonna need in a day's time, we get very little um, utilization or uh, loss there. And so, you know, 85% utilization would sure be a, a good goal to have in mind. But, but in, the, in this case, they added another $100 component by putting an electric fence uh, down the middle of that when they unroll it and uh, got 5% more uh, utilization. So what is 5% less waste, you know, say at $100 um, per bale, if it, if it costs that much, you know, in, in, in the worst years, those, those uh, prices do shape, shape up. And so we, we can see $5 a bale to, to $150 for 30 bales. So depending on how much you feed in a year's time, um, you can see that 5% does add up and actually would pay for that little, little uh, step in energizer. They run about $100 um, to, to add to this uh, option. And so how this works is usually a little bit of planning needs to go in, involved in this. Uh, we wanna think about unrolling that hay on maybe a daily basis or at least a couple days basis. And, and again, uh, I might have an electric fence, uh, have one unrolled for the next day, uh, but definitely wanna run that electric fence down the middle of that. And then it, what that does is, is uh, keep those cattle from, from laying in it and, and kind of makes it as a manger effect. And so we wanna start with uh, the water source. Uh, we wanna start unrolling that hay the closest to the water source and then you just move up from there and it's kind of a lot like strip grazing. And so I've, I've, I've seen producers uh, make equipment uh, where they can uh, pull one of these hay bales out from, from in the field with, with, uh, with a chain and just unroll it across that field in no time with an ATV or a small small truck. Uh, and of course, we've got uh, equipment now that will, will fit on the back of a truck, do ease, those kinds of things, those products. And so uh, we've got a lot of options when we want to think about um, feeding hay. So in summary, improved hay storage and feeding uh, uh, is something we should look at every year. Um, you know, 
think about oh, around that 10% loss for barn stored in the hay overall, but we can we can see a higher a higher levels of around 25% for, for uncovered and outside. Again, hay feeding waste uh, in ring feeders probably is somewhere around that 13 to 20% range. Um, with our best one being around 5%. And then we can get as high as 24% waste of unrolling it again if we're, if we're you know, trying to put out a week's worth of hay. Uh, whereas, um, you know, we can sure reduce that if we, if we uh, uh, limit the amount we unroll to, the, to what the cows need in that day. Uh, if we were to go that next level step and, you know, take uh, hay grinders and we, we can sure decrease the amount of hay that is wasted. But uh, again, you know what, you, I want you to think about uh, the price of, of those things and see if it pencils out. But uh, we can see very little, little wastage in that, in that scenario as well. So I think I've set uh, Justin and, and them up pretty well. And in this picture is, uh, you know, this is why my cattle weigh more than yours is mine eat rocks. And, and so they're gonna tell you on how to, how to deal uh, with feeding cows without any hay, I believe. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Brian, very good. Brian did do a really nice job setting up our next topic. Uh, we're gonna start in uh, uh, Weston, Justin, if you guys don't mind uh, opening your video. Weston, I'll just ask you if you don't mind just give us a quick overview of your ranching operation. And of course, we'd like for you to just kind of briefly describe your wintering program and how or if you even use hay and, and understand that the you know, topic here at this point is uh, kind of reviewing hey, can you systems hear me? Where, where not much hay is fed. Okay. Yep, sounds good. Uh yeah, our operation is 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 here in Ellis County, which is uh, of course the net northwest part of the state. Uh, so we have a less rainfall than you folks do there in the Stillwater area. But uh, this this operation has been been around my wife's family for a long time. Um, we've it's always been kind of a low cost operation. Uh, operate a lot of a lot of lease country, um, and with all the pros and cons that are involved with that situation. Uh, we've, we've never, we've never, this operation's never fed very much hay and there would have been a time when it would have fed no hay at all. Uh, we do feed a little bit of hay to our replacement heifers, our first calf heifers that are calving, um, while they're calving and our bulls at this point. So the mature cows uh, don't get any hay. Um, we, we, uh, feed a range cube, uh, generally at 38% in, in the early part of the winter, uh, we'll switch to a, a 32% or a 30% range cube, uh, after those cows, uh, most of them have calved and have a calf nursing. And then, uh, we might switch to a, uh, to a 25% cube, uh, even later in the spring or, toward the end of the winter, early spring. Um, we won't quit feeding cake uh, until maybe even the 10th or 15th of May. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, a lot of country that has shinry oak on it. Uh, there's some challenges involved with that as far as uh, tannic acid and shinry poisoning. So we feel like by continuing to supplement while that stuff's budding out and, and, and uh, blooming that we can limit the amount of uh, tannic acid poisoning we get associated with shinry. So all that to be said, it's a, it's a long winter feeding. Uh, there's a lot of days of feeding. Um, we calve in January, our heifers will calve, start calving the first of January, our cows will start calving a couple of weeks after that. Um, we, we put quite a lot of pressure on our heifers uh, when we're breeding those heifers to uh, to breed, we do hay hay them. Uh, I, I know I don't know if Justin even hays his heifers, but uh, we do hay them a little bit. That 60 days before we breed, uh, we AI them and then give them one shot to get uh, bred with a cleanup bull, so a bulls with them for about 22 days or so. So um, and we'll get about 80 percent of those heifers bred. 
Um, that's different than we were doing years ago. Years ago, we used to give them, you know, 60 days or more to get bred with the bull. Uh, we feel like by putting more pressure on them, we've, we've, we've sure increased the, uh, um, the reproductive efficiency of the, of the cow herd. So uh, I don't know that, that that's kind of a, a start, I guess, uh, David, so. Excellent, yes, thank you. Justin Barr, a uh, past extension uh, educator from the western part of the state. Uh, Justin also has a family cow calf operation. And Justin, I'll let you, uh, if you, if you don't mind, please give us an overview of your operation. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we cow calf operation uh, run on some leased land, some uh, mainly owned land, but uh, some family leased land. Uh, we oh we start feeding pretty early we'll start feeding september 15th october 1 um, and and usually feed through april 15th uh, i feed three pounds of a 37 percent cube a day um, if you punch that in or look at it you know in the in the winter time when them cows are are heavy bred and 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 when they're they're lactating after the calf's born, why well, you know your body condition score goes down pretty hard. But uh, we start early trying to pick them cows up. Once we've weaned, we usually wean around September fifteenth. We have everything weaned and we start feeding those cows. And we still got a little green grass and we can get some condition back on those cows. And and we expect to lose condition uh, with that feeding program, but. You know, I, I, in the past years, we, I think, you know, we still get around 95% conception on most of those cows uh, rebreed, um, but uh, we feed very little hay. Uh, most of our hay is fed in the pens when we're weaning calves or, or stuff like that. We do have a hay pile, you know, for inclement weather or whatever. We try to keep a bale of hay per cow in, in the, in the hay pile. So we got some for snowy days and stuff. Uh, but I've got some that haven't seen a bell in a couple of years, you know, so, um, that's kind of our program. We, we have a little later than Weston. I, we usually don't start the cows till February 15th, kind of average calving date would probably be March 15th. Uh, and that, I think that helps a little bit. We get a little green grass on those cows a little quicker after they've calved. So we probably don't feed quite as long, except I've got some of the same country. Weston does the San Shinry country and, and we'll sure watch the Shinry there and, and keep feeding those cows as long as there's a threat of, of them, you know, the, the, the tannic acid and stuff, but then quite a little of our country don't have any shinry, so so we can sure stop there. Um, but basically, that's kind of our deal. Is three pounds a day for? Oh, we figure about 200, 210 days of feeding actually. So we look at about. It usually takes between six hundred and six hundred fifty pounds of cubes per cow a year. Um, and, uh, and very minimal hay, but, uh, but I guess, uh, I don't know. I probably didn't do a very good job of summarizing, but that's, that's what we do. We just feed high protein cubes straight through. That's what I've been doing the last four or five years and got along pretty good. Our heifers, uh, I, I run a lot of my, my weaning calves on wheat pasture. I don't run my heifers on wheat pasture. I'm kind of like Weston. I treat my heifers pretty tough. Uh, I, I want them. I I was running those heifers on wheat pasture and getting you know really good results on them breeding up. But the next year I lost lots of heifers uh, on the rebreed. So we <clears throat> my idea is is kind of rough them through and and get the real fertile ones bred. You know and and so I'll start with at least. 30% more than I need, maybe 50% more heifers than I need. Uh, this last year, I, uh, I, uh, AI'd, we, we sink them and AI them and I, I watch heat one more time and AI any, I started with 25 and got 22 of those heifers bred. 
four right. of them was in the second heat. So I had really, really good results this year. I, I wouldn't expect that again, but it, it worked really good uh, this year. And uh, I, I feed those heifers, you know, they get cubes too on dry grass uh, to develop them and stuff. And, and, you know, we don't start feeding or breeding on those heifers till April, uh, late April there. So we're usually, we get just a tick of green started before we start breeding them. Uh, I was back on my breeding dates a little bit earlier. I moved forward about a month and have been toying with moving forward another month because of the green grass deal uh, and getting some of those cows and heifers bred a little better. Uh, so, but that, anyways, that's kind of what we do. And like I say, I kind of try to sort those heifers out on uh, by treating them kind of rough and just get the real you know, the easy keepers, the, the high fertility ones bred and, and go from there. Very good. Thank you, Justin. Uh, so anyone who has questions for either of these two or Brian, uh, you're welcome to type your question in the chat and we'll get to it. Um, I guess a thing, a question I thought of for uh, both Weston and Justin, I'm curious. <clears throat> it sounds like it would, you know, I assume that your forage quality is uh, pretty similar to low quality grass hay or worse, perhaps by maybe by February. Um, so with that in mind, tell us about your selection program. What, what have you targeted in terms of traits to find cows that can deal with no hay feeding and, and uh, just a little bit of, of a protein energy supplement all winter long. Well, <laughs> I, I know me and me and Justin, we occasionally run into each other at the bull cell and, and I think we look for similar things, you know, kind of the common sense stuff, Dave, uh, trying to keep I'm I'm trying to keep my cow size down doing not probably not doing a very good job of it uh, I don't know how many registered guys are, are watching this but I'm proud to be talking to more of those guys um, cow size just seems to get harder and harder to keep control over for me anyway um, milk production uh, watching milk EPDs we try to keep that moderate at best if, if not on the low side I mean, so that that's a couple of things that we look at really hard. I don't I don't know what, and and you know, back to the breeders. I mean, and not trying to, not trying to knock anybody because everybody's got a different program. But uh, you know, if if you can find a breeder that that has a similar program that you to you ha that you have, I think it it make has made it easier for me, and um, and that's, I don't know. It, the registered deal is, is hard because we all want to see big weaning weights and, and heavy yearling weights and 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 they they've got to do that to, to sell cattle and, and so it, it makes it difficult i think for for everybody yeah i uh... I guess it's my turn. I, I agree with Weston. Uh, cow size is a big deal. I, I look at on my bull selection um, and, and milk. Uh, uh, sure try to keep milk average. Uh, don't don't chase the high end milk uh, bulls or the or the great big uh, uh, cow size. Uh, you know, one of the hardest things for me was. Uh, when, when you're weaning calves and everybody's talking about the, the pounds of calves they're weaning, how big they are and stuff, my calves aren't, aren't always, you know, they're, if we wean 600 pound calves where we're, we feel like we've done really good and, and, you know, they'll probably be more like a 585 weight uh, uh, calf when we wean them uh, across the board. But, uh, uh, you know, I guess I use wheat pasture to catch some of that gain up later on too, you know, uh, we can wean those and, and run on wheat and, and, you know, after the first of the year, a lot of times them calves, you know, gain three pounds on wheat pretty easy and, and we, we make up quite a little difference uh, 
on that program, but but the the genetics is really hard, and I, I agree with Weston. The hardest thing to do is find find somewhere to buy bulls that that are that have a moderate uh, frame score and size, you know, and and can keep heifers and stuff out of those. Uh, uh, but there's some around. Uh, I've got a neighbor that that does a pretty good job, and I've been using a lot of his bulls and and really helping with my deal. Uh, so. But uh, I guess cow size and, and the milk, you know, I, I don't know that my cows, uh, it don't, they don't milk as good as some. And, and part of that's probably genetics and part of it's probably feed. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, we get along pretty good and, and just get past the coffee shop talk and not worry about what my weaning calves weighed, why uh, kind of has got me past the point of, uh, doing what I'm doing and staying with it, you know. With, with that in mind, another quick question. I'm going to keep thinking of these, I'm afraid. But what, would you mind sharing, and understand you, you don't have to if you don't want to, but would you mind sharing about what you think your annual cow costs are? And or feed costs, if you'd rather just uh, feed and grazing costs, if you got that top of mind well um i guess i could give you like a you know just a just a cake cost uh off the top of my head dave is, is running you know 100 looks like this year it's going to run close to 120 dollars a head kind of figure i've got in, in my mind that i'm looking at on cake um so you know and, and i think as far as grass cost goes you know these these leases range all over the map out here, depending on who's leasing from who deal. But you know we're running on our sorry country. We're running thirty acres of cow. Uh, so I mean, put a figure in there for what you think a lease. You know your per acre cost on a lease, and that that gives you an idea on, on that. Uh, you know I think a, a pretty good ballpark uh, overall figure for. For that would be you know around 10 bucks an acre uh, i'm not saying that's that's my cost i'm just saying that uh, a, a kind of a typical lease cost maybe in this area might run around that uh, so you know you're looking at 300 dollars a cow there uh, for those those two items um, yeah right or, or for the for the grass and then another 100 120 for the for the, the cake uh, some of the guys i see that feed a lot of hay it seems like they might use maybe even a half or a third that number of acres per cow, but then feed pretty well feed hay nonstop from from now till spring. And so, I mean, considering all those costs on hay that we saw Brian go through there a while ago, I mean, that gets pretty substantial too. So, and Brian, if you if you I don't know if you would have happened to have calculated what you think it might be in a kind of an average A cost in Southeast Oklahoma. It'd be interesting to compare to those numbers. Justin, do you have anything on that? Yeah, um, it's, uh, we, we we're, we're in a family deal and I, I, uh, I run some cattle with my son and my father-in-law. And uh, this past year, I've, I've really looked at what it costs uh, per month to, to run a cow. Uh, and, and I think I'm at 33 bucks a month is what we're charging. Uh, is what, like my son's cows, it's on me. I'm charging 33 bucks a month to run a cow, which is, if you figure that, it's about 400 bucks a year. Um, we try to keep $200 a cow in, uh, in grass cost. Um, I'm like West and some of our good, our sorry country, we're up to you know, that 28 acres per cow or better country. We might get down to 16, 17. And that's with, that's with some improved grasses in, in the mix uh, that we run on. Uh, but a good average is probably in that 22 acre deal. Uh, so, uh, but we, we figure we get about $200 or I figure I get about $200 in grass a cow. And we're sure going to get that 150 bucks or so cake cost in there, I think. Uh, uh, so 
So what, that's what we kind of been charging each other is 33 bucks a, a month. Uh, which uh, has kind of been working for us on on doing the deal and and inputs and stuff and and that that's including furnishing mineral on those cows. Gentlemen, we've got a couple questions in the in the Q and A, and I'm not sure if you can see those, so I'm going to go ahead and and read those if if you will. Um, for each of your operations, and understanding that. I think it might be important to recognize that you all are in Northwest Oklahoma uh, and that that country looks a lot different than other parts of Oklahoma, but you might describe describe what in general uh, those cows are looking at, um, you know, to, to run. Uh, so in particular, our, our friends from out of state that join us understand uh, it, it may not be lush grass uh, that they're looking at year round there. And, and then also, if you would, Talk to us about what you're what you're looking at your optimal mature cow size. Uh, what you know frame score weight wise. What what does that? And I know Weston, you've uh, discussed that a little bit, but maybe a little more detail on on what does that ideal cow look like? Um, Justin probably does a better job at nailing down details than I do on a lot of this stuff, but. Uh, you know, for us, we kind of, as far as the, well, let me start from the beginning or I'll forget, forget where you started at. Um, as far as the grass out here, you know, it's a, um, it, the, in the sand country, it's a lot of little blue stem, big blue, uh, Indian grass, all the, all those native grasses. So, uh, we kind of go by the rule of the thumb, you know, take half, leave half. Frankly, we probably leave more than half uh, in most of our pastures. When we get into the tighter soil, there's more short grass, um, you know, the buffalo grass uh, and, and some of those short grasses, so a little better country. Um, so I don't know, that, that's kind of what the country looks like. The, the, the forage quality will be really, really good in the middle of the summer. And, and the cattle will, will put on a lot of condition really fast and do well in the summer. It falls off really quick by about the 10th of July and grass quality really goes to drop them. Uh, you know, kind of like Justin, we, we wean early, we'll start weaning heifers and old cows in early August. So those calves are gonna be seven months old, six, seven months old when we start weaning in early August, gives those cattle time to put a lot of flesh back on uh, before the grass falls totally apart in you know, early October. Um, so with that being said, again, back to condition uh, adaptability and, 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 and keeping those cows in good condition. If they're, if they're a big high producing cow, they're gonna really struggle. Um, I would say ideal, uh, ideal uh, frame score size for me would be about a four and a half. I don't know how many of my cows are four and a half. Uh, we used to say we have 1,150 pound cows, but I'll be honest, we don't have many of them anymore. We just don't. Uh, you know, I would say our cows, average cow size is probably approaching 12 and a quarter, 12 and a half, to be brutally honest. And I hate that when we keep trying to, to struggle against that. But again, you know, you're trying to, you're still trying to get performance. I think a guy can, can drift off the other direction too. You know, we retain all our calves and we're going to go through some kind of a program, whether it's a weed, a dry winter program, green grass the next summer, uh, direct to a feed yard 60 days after weaning or, or feed yard after wheat and then after uh, a, a, an early intensive grazing type system in the summer. So we want performance in those cattle. So trying to get all of that put together with the small frame size and a, and a highly productive re, uh, cow that reproductively efficient becomes a struggle for us. But um, I don't know if that's kind of a jumbled up answer. Justin would probably do better than that. Yeah, I agree with Weston. You know, everybody like uh, a lot of the guys think they got a thousand pound cow and they're lying to themselves. Mine's probably more 1200 pound on the average, uh, maybe 1250. But I still think that's probably on, on the low side of the average cow side in the country right now. Um, we, I'm like Weston. Um, 
I, I guess, you know, on, on standing, uh, I guess my grass probably, my, my environment probably limits me more than the genetics do, uh, you know, of what I can do with the cattle. So I, if I can have average, why well, I, I can do probably all I can do with my, with the forage I have, uh, you know, it, I'm not going to have a creek feeder out for my calves or anything. So I'm not going to push them, but, uh, but we do, uh, I, I guess just fighting that cow size is pretty tough. I mean, and, and, you know, my cows, I'll sell some cold cows that will weigh more than that, but they're sure fat too. You know, uh, they're fat. My cows in working clothes are probably in that 12, 1250 range most of the time. Um, and, and, and they'll be thinner in the spring when they calve and stuff. But, uh, anyways, I guess, uh, what was the question again, Rosalind? I think you've got it covered. Just okay. kind of okay. what does what do the places look like um, for, for the cows? And and again, I think both you all addressed it very well. Uh, certainly appreciate the comments about uh, getting some weights on those cold cows and taking a look look back at it really finding out what uh, what do my cows weigh at the end of the day? Even though I think they might be in that. Um, 1,100 pounds, uh, they, they may be in excess of that. And so I think that's important note for folks to, to take, um, take a look at. So Weston, you kind of addressed this, um, you know, as far as what the in, in market for your calves are. Um, if you had anything to add to that, and Justin, if you, if you feel comfortable sharing, like how, how, what's the market look like for, for ones you're raising? Well, uh, typically, like I say, right right now we the family we farm some some we have some wheat ground that we we like to go wheat pasture on. We're in the process of converting that back to to grass, uh, so we'll kind of lose that. But uh, right now, like last year, we we didn't get any wheat pasture, so I I weaned those calves, straightened them out. We kind of dry wintered them, and I sold on Superior in January in their big sale uh calves sold really well condition on them was good you know them calves probably weighed six well they weighed 605 and had a frame to weigh seven or better you know but so i, I they got 37 percent cubes and all the dry grass they could eat uh is, is all they got uh, and it back to the country i'm like weston i'm in the sand uh, shinry country then we're getting some red hills, which we consider a little better. And then down in, in central Dewey County, we got a lot of blackjack country, blackjack oak country. But the grass species are a lot the same. Uh, little blue, big blue switch. And then, you know, on our better country, we'll have some of the gammas and the, and the buffalo grass and stuff. But uh, but basically, uh, and and to utilize our grass, I kind of use my, my calves to you know, if, if I think grass is a little short, I'll wean a little earlier and get rid of those calves quicker, uh, maybe to, to save some grass for some cows. So we kind of use our calf crop to, uh, to, to store our grass. And, and this year, I don't have near enough cows. We had a tremendous summer out here. The grass is really good. Looks really good everywhere. We, we was a little scared this spring going into it, but well, we just, every time it seemed like we needed to rain throughout the summer, we'd get a little bit and, and had a good grass crop. But I guess that's kind of our deal. And, and, and then we stalk light, you know, we're not on the heavy end of the stalking rate. So uh, we, you know, we can kind of, that we take, try to take half and leave half. And, and I'm like Weston, we may leave more than half a lot of times. Any one, one additional question in the Q and A, everything spring calving, or are we doing any fall calving at all um, for, for either operation? Ours are all spring. Um, years ago, I know my, my wife's grandfather maintained a fall cabin herd on some of his better country uh, in some of the red, red hills and uh, shale pastures that have some creeks and stuff on them on the east side of the ranch. And, and uh, he just finally decided his costs were just too high uh, to make that work. And, and, and we haven't tried it uh, since I've been around again. So, but uh, 
would love to have a fall cabin herd, but I think it'd be pretty difficult to make it work in this operation. And once again, I, I'm spring cabin totally. Uh, I'd love to market fall calves, but uh, I don't think I could keep those cows bred uh, with the program we have uh, on dry grass and stuff. I, uh, I just, I'm like Weston. I, I haven't ever tried it, but I think the, the feed cost and stuff would be uh, a little bit abundant for me to make it work we, we try to try to use green grass to breed the cows on and, and this this question i want to open up to brian too and i'm sorry just i'm, I'm going to mute you occasionally because we're getting a little bit of feedback at least on my end um off off the microphone but i want to uh, open this up to brian too weston we'll start with you um in your opinion, what what are the benefits for you uh, as far as limiting limiting that hay usage? Is it is it cost? Is it efficiency? Is it labor? Um, you know, transport of getting getting bales. Uh, what what are the advantages to how you're you're managing with limited uh, hay usage? Well, the biggest thing, of course, is is cost. I mean, if, if you start figuring uh, how much how many more dollars we would be talking about. Uh, to, to implement an aggressive hay program, e even not a, even not feeding a lot of hay, even just kind of feeding like I do my replacement heifers or my first calf heifers, which uh, I'll let them have about, oh, 15 pounds a day, you know, 12, 15 pounds of hay a day after they calve there for 60 days or so. Uh, but if, if even if you were to, to just do that, I mean, Gosh, when those heifers, when we're calving those heifers out, we'll calve out, you know, we may calve out 150 heifers or something. And when, when we're calving those things out, it feels like all you do is cart hay around. And if you had, if we had to do that across the ranch, it would really drive up our cost. Uh, you know, we, we have hay beds on all our pickups, but honestly don't need, wouldn't need them, but on a couple of them probably, but years ago, uh, you know, we didn't have any hay beds on any of these vehicles. You could just, I mean, that doesn't sound like much, but the cost of a hay bed compared to what you can get by without a hay bed, it, there's a lot, several dollars there. So with more hay, you, every, every direction you drive up your hay cost, you drive up your cost. And, and there's no cheap way to do it, whether you're buying it or trying to bail it yourself. I mean, I think Brian, you know, you look at his numbers, you can see all that. And we had a we had a ranch lease for a few years that had some some farmland on it and nothing nothing good came out of that project but we did learn we sure couldn't bail it, it we were better off buying it and it, so there's no cheap way around it there just wasn't any cheap way around it so i guess i'll add I'm, on my own experience my own cattle to you know, by limiting my cows on, on the amount of hay, it may be I, I have a pen where I can just allow those cows in for a short period of time and, and just allow them to, to maintain their body condition. That's really what the goal is to minimize our cost, uh, but still not sacrifice the reproduction that we're, that Justin probably was talking about. I had a power outage here, so I'm, I'm sorry I missed a little bit of this session. Uh, thankfully, it went out after I got done talking earlier, but uh, it... Uh, you know that that to me is making those cows do the work instead of us bringing the bringing the feed to them is 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 always my number one goal. And Dave, uh, I probably used to be a goal we'd shoot for a dollar a day on a cow, and now if we can stay under two dollars a day, that's probably where where we'd be setting a good goal again. I might just add one more thing as far as and Justin's same situation. These, these pastures are pretty large. And, you know, the last thing we want is those cows to congregate in some area. Uh, we're, we're wanting them to spread out. And the less, the less they're trying to stand around a bale of hay or come to a feed pickup, the better off, the better off they are and the better job they do utilize, uh, you know, what we've left for them in the pasture. Yeah. The hay that I do use, I, I put up, we, we have some hay equipment and, and utilize some, some old world blue stem grass to put hay up. Uh, um, you know, we'll usually fertilize it pretty good in the spring and take one cutting off of it and, and get all the hay we need for the year on, on our cow deal. Uh, and it, I, I'm pretty sure we could buy it cheaper than, than 
what I've got invested in the hay equipment, but mine's a bunch of old junk, so it's not any new new equipment. And we we get it rolled up. I, basically, the only place I use hay hay rings or anything's in the pens and stuff. Uh, if any of the cows get hay, it's uh, it's unrolled to them or, or you know scattered out, uh, and it's just just in a uh, you know snow cover or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, and we just, uh, I know it's hard for some guys to, but like Weston said that, you know, my pastures aren't as big as his, I know, but we try to keep those cows. We like, we like to have to go hunt for them when we go feed them. Uh, um, and, and then, uh, you know, we just have a lot of standing forage there for them. You know, the snow, we get a six inch snow my cows will be all right that they, they, there's grass sticking up they'll they'll find it you know but you get socked in one of them long icy deals or something while we'll feed some hay and stuff then but it everything we do with hay seems to cost money uh you know uh, we, we break down putting up hay and then twine and stuff like that's got yeah, well, it's just like everything. All the cost has gone through the roof on everything. All right, Dr. Lawman, I've got right at one o'clock. Hey, all right, excellent. Boy, that's that's really good stuff. I appreciate you guys. Hey, let me get one more question in here. And uh, I, I, if you could just answer real quick, uh, both of you. I'm curious, you talked about the trends in cow size and your desire for a more moderate type cow. Do you think over the years, assuming your management is the same from year to year or reasonably similar from year to year, the long-term trend, have your calf weaning weights gone up or have they not? I, I would say, for us, our calf weaning weights have probably stayed just about the same on our cows. We have improved our calf weaning weights slightly on our heifers. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. And, and that's been through the AI deal. And, and that's been not, not so much a factor of the genetics in the AI deal, but a bunch of bunching those calves up in a really tight window. So average uh, is what gotcha. about on, on that deal. But okay. I would I would say honestly on the on the overall on the on the cat mature cows i was just looking this morning um our steers that we were weaning uh in august were weighing in around uh the, the very early calves were were weighing around 580 those steers and the heifers were weighing around five five uh what's it now 550 and then by the time we finished weaning that last that third week of september September 23rd or 4th or sometime along in there, um, those steers were, were up to about 650 and the heifers mm -hmm. were just touching a tick over six at that point. And so that's, that's real similar to what they were 25 years ago when I moved wow. out here, uh, real Probably similar. Just it was a good summer too. They were heavier than they were last year. I'll, I will say that. Yes, and you I assume the answer may be similar for you because you said that your country, you thought your country limited performance of your cattle more so perhaps in the genetics or limited the genetics expression, maybe. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't have, I know Weston and them have a lot better records, a lot further back than I do, but the, the last five to 10 years, I, I wouldn't say that my weaning weights have increased any. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they've stayed pretty mute, I think. Uh, um, and, and, and I do think I've, I've, I've increased my, my weights later in the year on those cattle, you know, when we put them on the, the wheat pasture or whatever, I think those cattle are doing, are doing a better job for me, uh, yeah. on a good, good, uh, diet plan, I guess you'd say. You know, they they the compensatory gain is is maybe better than they were maybe five ten years ago. I I, I agree. I think that it, that it is. Uh, but but as far as weaning weights, I I wouldn't say they've just been. You know, we we what we don't weigh near as many as Weston do. But what I weigh, them steers are just usually in that five eighty to six weight, and they've been that way probably five six seven eight years. You know. Okay. Okay. 
I don't know about you, Dr. Biggs, Dr. Beck, but it's been a fun session, I think. Really, really useful information. I agree. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for joining us, taking the time out of your day and uh, away from your families and operations uh, to share uh, your expertise and insights. I think it's I think it's really valuable. I'm glad we were able to get Brian back on after that after that power outage and uh, sure interesting to take a look at those numbers uh, on on whether we uh, should be using hay or how we're using our using our hay in in the programs. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Lawman, you want to close us out? Yeah, we'll have uh, we'll have the video posted uh, by next early next week. And uh, we'll also post Brian's presentation. If you joined uh, late and didn't get to see that, we just uh, encourage you to take advantage of that there at beef.okstate.edu. We Thanks everyone, a, look forward to seeing you next week. We did put a couple of those links much. from Brian's presentation in the chat, if you were able to see those. And again, as Dr. Lawman said, beef.okstate.edu, uh, I'll have all our recordings as well as uh, additional information to help you. I put those, uh, I put your calculator link, Dr. Lawman, in the chat too. So uh, we got that, we got that shared. So thank you. Thanks everybody, we'll see you next week.